In just a moment, you will see two views of the atomic bomb explosion taken from the observer ships approximately 20 miles from Bikini Lagoon. The second view provides another excellent example of the cloud chamber effect, which is produced for a very simple reason. The atmosphere at Bikini was almost saturated on July 1st, and when the pressure wave hit the air, it was compressed and heated. After the pressure front passed, the resultant expansion of the air cooled it below saturation point and caused formation of the expanding fog cloud you have seen in each view of the explosion. Mounted atop a 100-foot tower on Bikini Island, over three miles from the point of burst. On the water, you can see the shock wave coming toward the camera. Watch those palm trees in the foreground. The next three views of the burst were taken by other automatic cameras on top of towers located on other nearby islands in the lagoon. cameras were started in motion by remote control radio signals emanating from aboard laboratory ships many miles away. You will notice in two of the scenes that a timing watch has been placed within view of the camera in order to afford the scientists a means of studying the speed relationships of the various phases of this explosion. The epicenter of the detonation of the bomb was approximately 650 yards from the USS Nevada at this point. The transports Gilliam and Carlisle, the destroyers Lamson and Anderson, and the Japanese cruiser Sakawa were sunk. The following ships sustained serious damage. Nevada, Independence, Salt Lake City, Skate, Y-O-160, L-E-M number one, Pensacola, Arkansas, L-S-T-52, Crittenden, and the A-R-D-C. The next ships to be seen were only slightly damaged. Nagato, Banner, Pennsylvania, Skipjack, Apagon, Parch, Butte, Dawson, Prince Eugen, Wilson, Stack, Rhine, Brule, Hughes, and the LCT-874. These were the first pictures taken from surface craft which made their way into the target area as soon as the danger from radioactivity had passed. The three ships visible here are an APA, the Salt Lake City, and the Independence. The smoke from the light carrier Independence is from burning torpedo warheads in the torpedo stowage on the hangar deck. In the foreground, numerous salvage tugs and radiological reconnaissance vessels are taking water samples from the lagoon for testing. We see the Nevada, Nagato, Saratoga, troop transports, freight and cargo ships, and other vessels in the array as the camera sweeps across the target fleet. This ship, the USS Pennsylvania, was about 1,800 yards from the epicenter of the bomb blast. Wreckage was slight and limited to minor superstructure damage. The fire burning amidships was in supply samples stowed on this deck and was not of a serious nature. In the background, a salvaged tug is seen fighting a small fire on the heavy cruiser Salt Lake City. This ship, 
the USS Saratoga was about 2,600 yards from the epicenter. The only damage sustained was a small fire topside and a minor operating mechanism of one of the airplane elevators. The Prince Eugen was about 1,700 yards from the epicenter. This ship sustained minor topside damage only. This is the USS Pennsylvania again, after the fire had been extinguished. This view shows her starboard side, which was away from the blast, and which sustained topside damage aft. This ship, the Japanese battleship Nagato, was about 850 yards from the epicenter. Damage was limited to topside fixtures and superstructure, which were considerably battered and broken. The epicenter sustained only slight damage topside. Shown here inspecting the damage to the ship is the Secretary of the Navy, and high-ranking officers. In the foreground is a shattered mirror which had been placed on the deck along with other equipment to be tested. This troop transport received extensive superstructure damage. The smokestacks, radio and radar antenna and supports, together with various other light topside structures, were broken or buckled. These animals survived the blast but died later from the effect of radioactivity. This ship, the USS Nevada, was about 650 yards from the epicenter. These pictures were taken from the side nearest the blast and show the superstructure wreckage. The paint on this side was scorched but did not burn. This view shows a portion of the unarmored deck aft, which was pushed down by the explosion. Aircraft and quartermaster supplies placed on this deck were considerably damaged. The next ship is the concrete oiler YO-160 which was located about 400 yards from the epicenter. The concrete hull was undamaged, but the superstructure was almost completely demolished. This ship, the USS Arkansas, was about 650 yards from the epicenter and sustained extensive damage to topside fixtures and superstructure. Salt Lake City was 1,000 yards from the epicenter. Superstructure wreckage was considerable. Both stacks were wrecked, and antenna and other fixtures were bent over or broken. The heavy cruiser Pensacola was located about 450 yards from the epicenter. This ship sustained serious superstructure wreckage. Both stacks were a total wreck, and numerous other topside structures were badly damaged. The submarine skate was located about 300 yards from the epicenter. The light fixtures, periscopes, and superstructure were demolished, but the pressure hull and conning tower remained intact and interior machinery was undamaged. The Japanese light cruiser Sakawa was located about 150 yards from the epicenter of the bomb burst. This cruiser was heavily damaged topside, and the hull ruptured aft, 
causing her to slowly flood. Although the Sakawa was commissioned only 18 months ago, she is considered by the Japanese to be a victory model and is not of modern construction. The hull, for example, was entirely riveted. Her superstructure, after the midships and above the main deck, was completely demolished. She capsized to port and sank the day following the bomb burst. This is the light carrier Independence, which was about 600 yards from the epicenter. This ship was severely damaged by the primary blast action of the bomb. The blast struck the Independence on the port side, blew in the light side plating between the hangar and flight decks, and pushed up the center of the flight deck like a rooftop. Both airplane elevators were blown up and overboard. The top of the island was completely blown off. Gun sponsons and guns on the port side were severely damaged. The watertight integrity of the hull remained intact. No fires occurred except among the torpedoes on the hangar deck aft. This class carrier was built on a basic cruiser type hull. The port side external plating was light blister shell plating and became deeply fluted between longitudinal frames as a result of the bomb burst. Similarly, the hangar deck plating is a light false deck built over the heavier hangar deck. Damage to the starboard side away from the blast was less severe. Although damage to some of these ships is impressive, it must be remembered that these experiments are not a contest between bombs and ships, but an earnest effort to determine what changes must be made in the future design and construction of ships, dispersion of bases, tactics and strategy in this new age of atomic power. This was Able Day. The period between the test Able date of 1 July and the test Baker date of 25 July was an extremely busy one for the technical and scientific personnel attached to Joint Task Force 1. During this time, the immense task of making detailed and comprehensive inspections and the recording of data resulting from test Able was completed. And in addition, the entire target ship array was reoriented. The basic premise which determined the target ship orientation for Test Baker was the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive, requiring that the ships be so disposed as to secure graded damage from maximum to minimum. The primary purpose of Test Baker was to secure precise ship damage and instrumentation measurements resulting from an atomic bomb explosion just under the surface of the water.